In the next 24 hours, 3,500 teenagers will try illegal drugs for the first time. I'm Lisa Gibbons. With more than 4 million American teenagers currently using drugs, it's clear just say no isn't enough. Today's kids are being raised by parents who lived through the drug culture of the 60s and 70s. If our generation survived, why shouldn't they? But the truth is, drugs were dangerous then, and they're even more dangerous now. Marijuana and heroin are two to five times more potent, and emergency room admissions for drug overdoses have increased by 2,000%. The truth is, until you know what drugs can really do to your body, your brain, and your life, it may not seem like there's a reason to just say no. My name is Alexis. I'm 17 years old. My name is Ryan, and I'm 17. My name is Kirsten. I'm 16 years old. My name is Jesse. I'm 17 years old. Drugs are easier to get than alcohol is. Marijuana is everyday thing. Quaaludes and stuff are pretty cool. Special K, Circle K. White Heavens. Rolls. E Smurfs. E, X, Hits, Fry. Ecstasy, marijuana, and acid may seem harmless and fun, but these four San Diego teenagers are about to get a look at the other side of these popular party drugs. Although they agreed to take part in the day's events, they have no idea what we've planned for them. At the first stop, drug counselor Sean O'Hara hands out Teen Files backpacks, Kristen? and the day begins. Oh, you like to get high? Yeah. How do you know you're getting what you think you're getting? You don't know what you're getting. You just Totally put integrity different. within whoever you're getting it from. Oh, that but nice drug dealer. Exactly. Right? Oh, but otherwise a knock on the door interrupts the group. Here's a little bit. We just received information about a party last night where there was four local teenagers involved. Um, there was drug usage involved. Uh, as I'm talking to you, there's three of the teenagers are in a hospital. One of them's really in serious condition. Somebody here may have been involved in the party, either supplying drugs or selling drugs. So we need to resolve that as quickly as we can. All right, what I'd like you to do is take your backpacks, please, and come over here and set them on the floor. The kids don't know it, but today we've enlisted the help of a number of organizations, including the San Diego Police Department, to show them what it can be like to live a drug nightmare. Where's the children? Come here. Come in. Come in. Kirsten? Yeah. Could you come over here, please? A search of a hidden compartment in the backpack reveals a surprise that we have planted. Props that appear to be the illegal drugs ecstasy, marijuana, and the liquid tranquilizer GHB. Okay, Kirsten, at this point you're under arrest. What you're being arrested for, Kirsten, is possession of narcotics, and with this amount you're going to be arrested for sales. Kirsten, you have the right to remain silent. If you give up the right to remain silent, anything you do say can will be used in court against you. You have the right to speak with an attorney of your choice or your parents before questioning and to have the attorney or your parents present during questioning. And if you cannot afford an attorney, one will be appointed for you by the court prior to any questioning. Do you understand each of these rights that I've explained to you? Yes, I have. With Kirsten facing time in prison, the group moves on to find out the fate of the other three teens at the party. When getting high, how much can you trust those around you? If you're in a group, your friends are always gonna take care of you. No girl goes to a party by herself. But sometimes, just being in a situation where drugs are used can hold unforeseen dangers. The next stop for the group is a hospital clinic. Hi, is there a, an Alexis here? Alexis, I'm Robin, nice to meet you. I'm a rape crisis counselor here in San Diego County, and uh, the police department said that your parents had called, that you were at a rave last night, 
and possibly some drugs were put in your drink and you were sexually, maybe physically assaulted. Do you have any memory about what happened to you last night? Okay. There were some witnesses said that you were unconscious and that you there were three males about your age that may have sexually assaulted you. And you might start remembering things that happen even though you were blacked out from the ecstasy. That is normal for a rape victim. Do you have any other questions? No. Robin has more to tell the group. Well, the reason why I'm here and I'm doing what I'm doing is because I also um, loved raves. I was totally into ecstasy. That was my drug of choice. I went to a rave one night with about four or five friends, and they were all girls. When Robin wasn't looking, a man spiked her drink with the drug ecstasy and then led her away from the party. And I was so high at the time that I didn't even know what I was drinking. I couldn't taste it. And uh, I, uh, it's kind of hard to talk about, but I kind of blacked out for a couple minutes and I woke up and he was inside of me and he was raping me and he hit me. It was a long time ago, but it's like, it's affected my whole life. Besides this terrible experience with the rape, I've had a lot of chemical problems because of the ecstasy on my brain. You know, I've been in recovery like three years now and I've had flashbacks to the rape. It's something that happened that I'll never be the same again. And you know, I was just having fun. So um, I hope that you guys can learn from what happened to me. I really understand and I'm really sorry that you had to go through that. I think it's horrible to happen to anybody. With one of our teens under arrest and the other a victim of sexual assault, the glimpse into their future continues. At Scripps Mercy Hospital, they learn one of them was found unconscious at the party. Witnesses say he was taking the drug GHB. All we know is that this is a 17-year-old uh, male whose name is Jesse. He was one of three people who were badly intoxicated. He was found down and it was unclear whether or not uh, he had been traumatized. This is Jesse's CAT scan, and what this shows us is he doesn't have any bleeding in his brain like he would have if he'd gotten hit, but his brain is swollen. And that's because his brain, we think, was starved for oxygen because of the drugs he took. And the problem with many of the drugs, the, the drugs he was taking, is it's a fine line between getting high and then being out. It could go very badly in the next uh, 36 hours. His brain could just swell so badly that all the blood flow is cut off and his brain dead and dies. One cap full of GHB is equivalent to six cups of alcohol. Overdosing on this toxic liquid can happen in an instant, changing a life forever. In the summer of 1999, 25-year-old Sidon Wells was at a club with friends. His sister Carly remembers. He um, got handed a water bottle that was filled with GHB, and he drank a lot of it. And he did not know. Um, this guy had taken all the active ingredients in GHB and doubled them, and he basically was guinea-pigging people that night. And my brother was dead five minutes later. Um, the ambulance came and they resuscitated him, but he was in a coma for two, two weeks. Um, when they brought him back, he had a lot of brain damage. Sidon survived, but he now lives in a convalescent home where he agreed to meet with our teens. This is my brother, Sai. Hi. Hi. Hey. Hi. How are you? Good. This is my mom. Hi, I'm Hi. Carrie. Hi. Three, one, two, three, nice and tall, nice and tall, nice and tall. Very tall. Sai is now trying to recover from the effects of the overdose with the help of his family and a physical therapist. Hi. 
no one knows if he will ever be the same. He will never go back to being the person he was before totally. I hope he can regain his sight. He said to me one day, Mom, I wish I could see. And it just really broke my heart. Do not do GAP. Be very careful. Bye-bye. It makes me not want to take GHB, but even more like not do any drugs. But then I think like, then how am I going to be around the people that I love to make sure that they don't? Because I know that I would never want to see someone that I love so much be like that. People don't go out with the intention thinking like that. They're thinking, I'm gonna go have a good time. You'd never expect something like size case to happen. And it just like tears you apart. Thinking that their nightmare has ended, the teens relax. But we still have one more surprise in store for them. The San Diego Fire Department arrives, saying they're responding to a 911 call of a 17-year-old male in cardiac arrest. Why, you can't tell me what drugs you took? Okay, you're gonna feel a stick here, and then we're gonna get moved to the hospital. Juan, Witnesses at the party reported that Ryan had been mixing marijuana, ecstasy, and alcohol. Relax, we're gonna be at the hospital in a little bit. When they're unable to get a normal heartbeat, Ryan is rushed to the emergency room. ER Dr. Sean Evans takes over. Let's get a second IV and open his fluids up at this point. And if we get the oxygen on 100%, is he still on the monitor? Yeah. I don't like that. Listen, yeah. we're going to assess your breathing. We're going to put a tube down your mouth, a tube into your throat. We're going to choke a little bit. Without Ryan's knowledge, we asked his mother, June, to be a part of this scenario. He's breathing way down. I don't even feel a pulse. You know what? Find me too. Let's shock him. Come on, we gotta move. This guy's gonna drop here. He's a young kid. Good. Paddles up. Charge 200. 200 jewels. They say for this. Clear. Charge. All right. We got anything? We got nothing. No, we still gotta continue CPR. Let me talk with this mom real quick. Give him 300 jewels. Best we can hope for at this point. I'm afraid is that we can actually maybe make him a donor at this point. We're hoping that we can keep his heart alive. Sometimes the brain won't come back. Okay. I'm gonna go ahead and let you think about that and talk with Jane, and we're gonna get pastoral care here. Well, no, let's hold for now. I think we're gonna go ahead and pronounce him dead. He's presently 1645. Let's pronounce him dead at this point. Ryan, if this really happened, my heart would be broken beyond repair. It makes you stop and think about what I've been doing. Think it's going to make a difference? Thank God. No. Drugs affect other people than yourself. You know, I never really stopped and realized it's a, too much to put your family through. I mean, they don't deserve it. They didn't ask for it. You're the one who wanted to have fun. I don't know why anyone, after what you saw, you would really want to go do drugs. Most kids know that drugs are bad, but this group from Bakersfield, California, has found another way to get high. On the danger level, inhalants is probably five or six, somewhere in the middle. And it's everywhere. It's anywhere. You say it's gasoline. That was your yeah. thing. I use spray paint. How about you, Jen? The same spray paint. The aerosol. The kids don't see, you know, a spray paint can bust or, you know, something like that. That's because inhalants aren't drugs. They're poisons. Today, Chief Coroner Jim Maloof is going to show our group what happens when you don't get caught huffing. How come you're covering your noses? Because it smells. You're smelling death is what you're smelling. You want to know what huffing does to the brain? That's real blood. You bet it is. And that's a real brain. It's not fake. Right here where the spinal cord comes out the bottom, that's what makes you tick. That's what makes you work. 
It's not going to be able to do that for you anymore when you huff. That's why you're going to get killed in the traffic. That's why when you go in the water, you're going to drown. Let's take a look at the heart. You can do a real quick huffing. It's going to change the rhythm of your heart to where you're not going to be able to get that oxygenated blood through your body. It's just not going to work. You can take heroin, you can take cocaine, you can take meth, you can put them all together, and it's still not equal what you're going to do when you're huffing. Because every organ in your body is being affected by huffing, and you can't get it out of your body. Sudden sniffing death is like Russian roulette. It can happen the 100th time you inhale. It can happen the first time. And the only reason I do this, and it's not to scare people, is to get you to realize this is real life. This is what we deal with on a daily basis. We want to see you grow up the way you're supposed to grow up. Young people are not supposed to die. Fire department. Yes, I need some help. My son is not breathing. Okay. Wade Heiss was only 13 years old when his mother made this call to 911. Moments earlier, his brother Rick had found him nearly unconscious in the backyard. Nearby was a can of air freshener. I yanked him up like this, and his body was just limp, and he was like, he was like exhaling, and his, his eyes didn't register. They were all glazed over. He would be looking up, but he was not seeing anything. Is he breathing right now or not? He's just moaning, and it's sort of breathing, but it's really hard. Okay. He's, he's turning all white and yellowish. Wait, wait. Okay, I want you to see if you can feel or hear any breathing or see if you yeah, can see the chest rise. Can you hang on a second? I uh -huh. paged his dad, who's a doctor. I, What's that? I paged his dad, who is a doctor, and get him on the other line. I was Christmas shopping, and um, I can remember every detail. Wade's mother was on the phone and said, <laughs> Richard, come home now. Wade's dying. Breathe. Oh, he's just everywhere. Breathe. 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 Don't. Wade. Wade. He's not breathing. When your midbrain goes to sleep, you can literally suffocate without knowing it. Those little spots we were talking about coming in the sides, that's your brain shutting down. And 11 and 12 and 13 and 14 and 15. Can you feel a pulse? There's nothing. Wait, wait, wait. No, don't. Wait. Wait. I couldn't imagine my little brother dying in my own arms. Yeah. No. So I hope you never have to. Yeah? I'm sorry for oh, everything you had to go through. Most kids don't realize how much their parents love them. And it never goes away. It's wild when having a doctor, you know, come to us and tell us that he had one of his sons just die. Just die. So young and off of something so stupid. It touched me because if I want to see 18, might as well stop doing what I'm doing. Every 24 hours, 3,500 teenagers will try drugs for the first time. 350 of them will become addicted. Anyone with a brain can become addicted to drugs. Why would anyone with a brain take that risk? My name's Matt, I'm 18 years old. I think I was high for six months straight, was my record. Matt and these other Seattle teens are about to take a new kind of trip. Guided by drug counselor Joyce Walker, they'll find out what happens when drug use goes from a moment of fun to a lifetime of addiction. So tell me a little bit about you, Matt. Um, Goals, hobbies, are you at? No, not, not this moment. My name's Jenna and I'm 15 years old. I went to school high off crystal and crank throughout this year when I actually did go to school. I wouldn't want to be addicted. What happens when you start to crash? Like I'll want it, like I'll do a lot 
go through a lot to get it. Okay, like what? Like steel. Okay. Or From who? People I care about. I don't understand if, like, you're using a hardcore drug or whatever drug, mm -hmm. why is it not okay to do it? If you make the money in an honest way mm -hmm. and you're mm -hmm. a good citizen, why is it wrong to do that drug? My name is Audrey and I'm 17. I started heroin, like, a couple months ago, and then, like, I got busted. And initially, it provided a good feeling. It relaxed you, maybe allowed you to, to concentrate. But chances are, if you continue to use, you'll become dependent on it. And it'll be your primary focus. And the things that once were important, getting good grades, um, keeping relationships that are with people that are important to you in your life, they will begin to diminish. Tonight, the teens will work with Street Links, a program that provides assistance to homeless youths. The streets of Seattle are home to more than 800 young people a night. Whether it's heroin, crack, meth, or alcohol, this is the last stop for many for whom drugs have become the primary focus of their lives. My parents, they're getting on my case really bad, telling me I couldn't have a place to stay if I was gonna smoke. I'd just be living on the streets, down at the Mission downtown. For 800 kids, we have one shelter with 15 beds. What they're looking for usually is a homeless kid who is not on drugs or alcohol, is not too depressed to create a problem, and not too angry to create a problem. So I guess a lot of kids don't get let in then, huh? <laughs> yeah. If I like end up doing drugs again, and that's what was meant to happen. If I get clean and stay sober and become real successful, that was meant to happen, because it's just fate. After helping to pass out hot coffee and soup, Audrey attempts to talk to the young people living on the street. Many of them are strung out on drugs and refuse to be seen on camera. 25-year-old Josh agrees to speak to the group. I used to own my own moving company here in Seattle. I had two trucks and the yellow pages three crews working for me, but I just, I, you know, slamming heroin, you know, and uh, it's not something that, you know, I'd wish upon anybody. I just got out of jail, for instance, like about a day ago, and uh, spent six days in jail, puking up blood and just laying in my own vomit, having people bitching at me for not cleaning up my area, but I didn't have enough energy to get off the damn bed, you know, to take my sheets to the door or anything. I mean, so do you get the high anymore, or do you just no, get what? Well? get high lucky if I get high once a month or something. You know, it's all about, I don't even have veins left. I don't even shoot stuff in my vein anymore. I have to put it right in my muscle because yeah. I don't have veins. It's just not about getting high anymore. It's about keeping from getting sick. I couldn't imagine myself living like that on the streets. It's just like a nightmare come true, I guess you could say. Every 60 seconds in America, a baby is born with a drug addiction. They have no choice in the matter. At the Pediatric Interim Care Center, the teens see how getting high can become more important than anything or anyone in an addict's life. This is what the babies look like, just as someone else coming off of drugs. These babies feel the same thing. They feel the tremors. They feel the gut aches. They feel the sweating. If we didn't support them, they're high risk for having a stroke or seizure, possible death. It started to upset me. Something so small going through so much torture when it didn't do anything. It was just born. You can't say, well, I've just used once, so my baby isn't going to be affected. I've seen babies that mothers supposedly only used once, and the baby is totally traumatized. Will she get better? She just keeps falling back asleep. And this is a baby that has not seen her mother since she's been here. 
Looked like a little baby doll. I was holding that baby, I had to leave the room because I didn't want the camera on me when I was crying, but I'm sure if you held a little baby that was addicted to heroin, you'd cry too. Getting clean can be a lifelong struggle. At the Ryther Child Treatment Center, 17-year-old Megan George is currently facing this challenge. I was really lonely. And then I got some friends, and they were cool, and then they did drugs. At 14, Megan started using methamphetamine, a drug so addictive you can become hooked the first time you use. They passed it to me, and I didn't want to look like a pansy, you know? I'm cool, I can hang it. My whole day consisted of sitting in a little trailer and just doing rails and smoking as much dope as I could. It wasn't even fun anymore, it was just my chore. There was a point where I would have gone up to somebody and just shot them, just right in their head for it. I'm not that kind of person. I mean, I'm smart, I have goals, <laughs> you know, I have a good family, and I was just being a junkie. The lowest point came when Megan, high on meth, threatened her brother with a butcher knife. Her mom was forced to call the police. It absolutely broke my heart to watch them arrest my daughter in my house. They put handcuffs on her and they took her away. And I thought I was gonna die. I mean, I think I'm a strong person. I'm tough. I am one bad person. You don't mess with Megan. And it's hard because when you look at yourself, I'm just, I'm like a little girl. I'm gonna be someone in life. I'm not gonna be just a bum living under a bridge looking for my next high. And I'd like to say just stop now and just say no, but I'm in treatment because I can't say no. I'm really scared. I don't like feeling like a child. I want to take care of everything and I can't. I need help. Drug addiction is a disease that changes the brain. Hi, Matthew. I'm Debbie. Hi. If your girlfriend wants to come along, she's more than welcome. Okay. Before changing his mind about drugs, Matt gets a chance to see how using has changed his brain, a brain that's been getting high for four years. Well, we're going to inject you with a small amount of a radioactive material, which actually is able to tell us what the blood flow is to your brain. A SPECT scan will give Matt this unique opportunity to peer inside his own skull. Ready? Okay. Matt's family and his girlfriend join him to hear the test results from Dr. Greg Hipskind. And there's a picture of what we would call a healthy brain right here, where you see the blood is kind of going everywhere and it's real smooth. You ready to look at your brain? Should yeah. we take a look at it? Yeah. All right, let's see what's going on. What you see is a somewhat shriveled appearance. 